Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, so we discussed in Saranda instructions not to focus obsessively on the papers, but to make some general remarks too. So I'm going to allow myself a bit of a rant about something vaguely related to the topic of the session at the end. But uh, I can't resist making maybe one comment on each of the papers. I thought they were all great. I think it's really wonderful to see what impressive work um, bright young people are coming up with these days in public finance. So it's an honor to, um, to talk about them. But I'm not going to praise them because I don't have enough time, not praise them one by one. So let me, one comment on each. So, um, and I should say, in terms of timing, the bad news is I had three pages of notes. The good news is I've, is I've lost one page. <laughs> So if I end a mid-sentence, um, you have to forgive me. So maybe to start with Casper uh, on IFF. Well, Casper won't be surprised to learn that I don't buy. I don't buy the broad interpretation of IFFs. I do think um, the distinction between things that are legal and that are illegal matters. Of course, we know there's a gray zone. But I think aligning these things is not helpful. And I'm not going to argue about what the word illicit means. I would just get rid of it. Um, and I would say the same about the other phrase that I equally dislike, which is tax dodging. What on earth is that? Um, and let me go through the reasons, <clears throat> although that's on my missing page of notes. Um, well, one, of course, it clearly matters for what you think the policy, what, the, what you think the response should be. If it's, is it a compliance issue or is it a policy design and a compliance issue? I think it doesn't help us. We do a bad job explaining these issues to the public. And I think it makes our job even harder if we don't actually explain if something's legal or not. I think when people see multinationals paying low amounts of taxation, they need to know, well, why is that? They need to know these are the rules. The rules say that if you don't have a physical presence, you're not going to pay tax. So I don't think we do the public any service at all by doing this. And I think without such a, when we use this distinction, <clears throat> if we don't make this legal, illegal distinction, we just lose any kind of compass on this stuff. We have to say, well, this is good tax avoidance because they're responding to incentive we want them to respond to. But no, this is bad tax avoidance because we didn't really want them to do that. And I think, again, Casper referred to it, you know, values change. Marijuana. Marijuana has become a big revenue source in many countries. Has it suddenly become licit when it was illicit before? Well, in that case, you're using a legal definition. Or was it licit all the way through? And that was, or has it, was it illicit all the way through? you're left with imposing your judgments on, on, on these things. So I'm, I know, Casper, I'm in a majority, I suspect I'm in a minority of one, but I certainly wish the IMF and OECD in particular good health in, in trying to uh, limit the use of the phrase. But I, again, I, that wasn't my rant, by the way. I have another rant <laughs> coming. Um, second, um, Dominica, I thought it's a very nice, I think it's a really nice idea of kind of having these interactions. Um, between you know, cross companies being introduced by, by CBCR. The one point that I found myself thinking about was these audit costs, because I didn't get why the audit costs, they didn't seem to depend on the tax rate in the in particular country. Maybe I'm wrong, but they, see, they just kind of, and I would have thought, you know, if these are ex post costs, I would think they would depend on what's the probability, you know, what's the probability you're going to have to make some adjustment. So then, and maybe that doesn't make any difference, but I would think that, well, we're going into things not in the presentation, but the theta A should somehow depend on the tax rate in that country. But I may be, mis may be misreading the model, but I thought it was a very nice way of going about things. Um, for uh, Jacob and Joe, I'm, I'm going to fall back on the discussant's remark of saying, what are the policy implications? Um, I think for, for, for Jacob, and I know it's in the paper, more on the kind of tax nerdy details of this, and I was going to look at the paper last night, but CEPR wanted to charge me six pounds, and I thought I wasn't going to do that. Um, but I think, you know, my, and partly my impression is that in the UK, um, it's become tougher towards non-resident ownership of property over the years. And it somewhat started, didn't it start more or less before Brexit? I know there was more later. Um, and I think the two issues are, well, are we saying there should be a, a, a special tax on non-residents, as some countries have? What do we think that would do? Um, the more complicated question, I think, is to do, the, to do with what I think is behind these corporate structures is these, this issue of indirect transfers of ownership, where you basically hold a, hold a property in London through a chain, and then you realize the capital gain in a low-tax jurisdiction. And that, I think, the UK is now fairly tough on, so I don't know if we're saying they should be tougher. And actually, there are, some, there are some real issues as to how you should tax those transfers. But the hardest paper I ever wrote 
was a paper we did at the fund on, on the, exactly this issue, in taxation of indirect transfers of interest. It's super hard, conceptually, because you're talking about levying a tax on capital gains related to something that's going to pay a tax on capital gains in the future. It's kind of a deferral issue. So I know that's not the, the, motive, the, the point of the paper, but I'd be curious to know more about that at some point. And for John, I mean, I thought it was, again, very, very nice. Um, I, I thought the interesting part was towards, was towards the end, where you think about this. Well, I should say, preface it, I was delighted by what you said about reporting magnitudes. I think that's very true. I think it's not just true for kinks. I think it's true for nudges, all kinds of things. You look at the numbers, they have a wonderful experiment, hugely significant. You think, well, wow, what does this mean for revenues? And kind of point oh 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 something or other. Um, so all, all uh, strength to you on that one. But, I mean, I think the question at the end of what is, the, what is, in some sense, I'm not quite sure you could think of it, move, somehow moving these people kind of by force beyond the kink. In some sense, it's to do, isn't it, with whether you want that kink at all or, you know, whether you kind of want the kink higher up or if everybody's going to move, why don't you just put the kink lower down, in which case, why don't you just have a flat tax or whatever. So I think there are these design issues as well as the kind of brute force thing. But if I have a few more minutes, let me come to my rant, uh, which is simply taken from the title of this session, Tax Havens. Um, and uh, I know John had nothing to do with tax havens, but the word tax havens appeared in other places. And I, should, and I start from this by saying, from very bitter experience, uh, I know that many countries find this term derogatory. And I think at a time where we try to avoid being gratuitously derogatory, we should think about that. And I should say I come speak from bitter experience, having been called into many meetings where I've been trying to defend the use of the term tax havens. Let me now try and step back and perhaps give a, some, some thoughts in the opposite direction. What do these countries say in the, in, when, they, when they express their upset at being called tax havens? One is they say we have lots of other non-tax attractions, we're well governed, good regulatory systems. Okay, fair enough, but we know tax matters, so let's not give them too much credit on that one. The other thing they say, of course, is what the lawyers call the two quoque argument. Well, everybody else does it. We're not the worst. There's the UK, which used to have, you know, these exemptions for non-resident investors in property in the UK. Why pick on us? We're just rather more open about it, perhaps. What about Delaware? Well, and you think, well, okay, yeah, you can't, it's hard to completely disagree with that. So then you think, well, let's focus on particular bad practices, not on countries which is what the OECD did in the outset of this project in 1998. Of course, that doesn't work um, for a number of reasons. You, that doesn't get you around the problem of zero taxes. Um, and it also, we know theoretically that actually having preferential regimes, giving preferential treatment for some things, can actually be beneficial in terms of how tax competition games work out. So, and what do they say then? Well, then, then they say it's our sovereign right to do whatever we want, and we can't help it if the rest of the world is filled with crooks who take advantage of the, the schemes that we offer in all honesty. Well, of course, there's a kind of aiding and abetting uh, argument there, uh, but it does focus attention, I think, on two key questions. One is that all this is ultimately a kind of a coordination problem. And normally when we think of coordination problems, at least we should be thinking, if there's an inefficiency, everybody can gain. It's actually supposed to be Pareto improving when we deal with coordination problems. That's what we should be aiming at. And often when we write down models, and I'm not mentioning any, not thinking of any of the ones here, we have, people often write down models and say, well, yeah, the low tax havens, tax havens lose out, but there's an aggregate gain, so who cares? I think that's really not good enough. We have to be a little bit more um, thoughtful in how we think about coordination issues, which, which is why I'm quite interested in things like what a minimum tax does, whether that has potential benefits for even ones forced to raise their tax rates. And I think the other, this is more or less where I'll finish, is the other thing that focuses attention on is, well, why, do high, why did high countries tolerate tax savings? They could have closed down these low tax jurisdictions, whatever we're going to call them, ages ago. They had enough power to do that. Why didn't they do it? Clearly, it makes you think, well, there are elites involved. The question then is, well, are those elites still there? Why has there been this kind of change of attitude? Um, seemed to begin with the global financial crisis, which was odd because nobody thought that tax havens had much to do with the global financial crisis. I think it's to do with kind of a lot of excellent work by civil society organizations, a um, little bit the need for revenue, but perhaps not so much when we look at the very little amount of money that's at stake in, in pillars one and two. So I'm not going to go on to argue that low tax jurisdictions are actually a good thing. Of course, there are people who would, and there are arguments you can make about that. But I think this is where 
This is where my notes leave me bereft of my wonderful closing sentence. But it was basically, uh, of course, I've chosen this rant to try and be provocative, but I think sometimes we might want to think a bit more, a bit more what, what do we really mean by tax havens and how do we actually think about them in welfare terms as we think about reforming the tax system. I think it's too easy to kind of dismiss them as kind of pariahs and who cares. Um, but as I say, I've argued the opposite in many, many occasions, but that's the argument I'm making today. So thank you very much, and uh, great papers, and uh, enjoy them all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mick. Um, I'm supposed to now ask the presenters to join the high table, but what I'm going to suggest instead is that you stay where you are, but that you turn around and speak to the audience uh, w when you get the mic. Uh, I think that's probably going to be a little bit more efficient. We don't have very much time. I will, though, uh, just very quickly um, uh, let the mic pass around the speakers just to hear whether you have any reaction uh, to make first, and then we'll get to the uh, other questions. No, I think uh, the discussion was, uh, was great. I mean... Obviously, we don't really agree on, uh, on whether to use the broad and narrow definition, but that's fine. Yeah, thanks. I also really enjoyed the discussion. Um, I also don't want to say anything about what you said about my paper, where you have a, lo a lot of good points. There's another version online that's remarkably similar to the one behind the paywall. Um, um, about the tax haven issue, so the British Virgin Islands have 30,000 inhabitants and 400,000 registered companies. They uh, are investing, like, they are 20% or 15% of the foreign investment in British real estate comes from these 30,000 inhabitants. That is a tax haven, you know? I'm not saying that there is not anything, you know, and, and I, what I completely agree with is the point that the boundary between tax havens and known havens is becoming more and more blurry, right? And more and more policies are being adopted in large OECD economies. Delaware is a good example, but also golden visa schemes. Uh, Dominica has a great paper on that. Or, um, um, you know, a citizenship by investment, all kinds of kind of... These kind of policies are being implemented in OECD countries all over the planet. I agree with that, you know? But there are also still pretty obvious tax havens. The reason I am insisting on the mic is because the virtual participants cannot follow uh, if we don't speak into the mic. So there's somebody here in the back. We'll start in the back, and then I can see you uh, from here, and then I will basically move up through the room. We will collect uh, some questions and then get reactions. Thank you. Uh, I had a question for Domenica. So th the model predicts that overall global profit shifting should fall, right? And I'm not sure how much you showed about that about this, and I also know that you know the, the update on the Veer Zuckman paper you cite, if anything, shows more profit shifting in the last five years. So I'm a bit wondering how you, you know, how we rationalize these two things. Okay, Dominique, you will take note, and then next hand, here in the back, okay. Also the same question, like uh, also the question about the same paper. Uh, what to do with companies that actually manipulate it, uh, uh, like across the threshold? Did you, you got the question? Yeah, okay. Okay, there was one here. Thanks. Um, I was actually really interested in John's paper, though it's a little bit off the topic, the other ones. But um, to John, because... I've also seen a number of papers that look at this same kind of bunching effect, but on, on businesses and particularly informal enterprises that are, are kind of self-reporting up to a threshold where they're paying a gross tax versus a profit tax. How do you think your results compare to them? Have you looked at them? Um, because I think there might be a lot more revenue there, um, and that might be a really interesting place. And I think that's why your study is interesting, because it might point to where audit resources should be going more effectively, and I think that's where where we can be looking there. Uh, and uh, one quick comment um, just about the first paper. I mean, just, uh, I, I work at the UN, I'm Peter Chowla, I'm at DESA. I should say clearly that, I mean, the UN does support the wider definition. That's not a choice of the Secretariat, that's a choice of member states. The UN Statistical Commission has officially endorsed the wider definition in its statistical uh, methodology for estimating IFF. So it's a choice by member states that they've had consensus on. Just wanted to comment on that. Thanks. Um, I have comments on everything, but I'll try and be disciplined. Look, John, I think your non-result. You will try. You will be. I will. I will. I will. Because Finn is here. Um, I think your non-result is a real result. We very often hear people pushing back that 
you know, we shouldn't worry about profit shifting for low income countries. The key thing is getting their tax system sorted out. I think demonstrating the scale or the non scale of that issue is very powerful. And I think you might find that Zambia compares extremely well to quite a lot of high income countries, and that's, that's a result too. So I would, I would really encourage you to push that. Um, um, Jacob, on, on your paper, uh, we've talked about other bits of it before, but I, I really like the comparison with Switzerland. And I'm kind of tempted to say, can you test something there? So firstly, can you look at the scale of abuse through the Swiss and the UK, um, or potential abuse, as it were, and say, you know, I is the UK basically at the cheap end of the market? Is it attracting illicit flows from lower income countries because it allows you to do it with a lower amount of money? And or, alternatively, is it something else? Is it UK empire? You know, is it the history of that? And uh, if you could test those two things. Last point to Dominica. I think your, your paper, in, in some ways your disappointing result on um, low and middle income countries is, again, the most positive result. It's the one that we'd expect. Bec when we put forward country by country reporting, the, the idea was that it would be public and, and we're gonna get there, we will get there. And then the benefits will be disproportionately towards the countries that lose most, lower income countries. But at the moment, because it's not just private to tax authorities, but has this very complex information exchange thing that only benefits OECD members, what we've said is that we expect this to worsen the inequalities in taxing rights facing lower income countries. And that's what your finding says, subject to the caveat that all this is absolutely terrible. For the, but it, to the extent that we can buy the result, I think it's what we'd expect. So it's a good result. All right, I'll limit it to one question, but I, I must say that all papers were very interesting, so thank you for your presentations. My question will be for Jacob. Uh, it's a very interesting paper as to real estate uh, uh, ownership. And um, you probably have reflected what could explain the increase after 2015, and, um, and I would like to hear a bit more about that. And also where, whether you have reflected on the implications of your study on the, um, some of the work that the uh, UK is doing domestically, meaning uh, we know um, uh, the annual tax on enveloped dwellings, which was introduced by the UK, is precisely to limit this type of practices so that high value properties would not be held by uh, through corporate structures. And obviously that tax has been increasing uh, throughout more or less the period that you're looking at. Have you tried to look at those uh, interaction? I know it was not your main question, but I think it could have very interesting uh, light on, on, on domestic tax policies and also the more recent development on the register of overseas entities owing UK properties uh, because that can bring you some light on the whether transparency part plays role in this practice like uh, the, the incentive to, to put the corporate structure in between. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, then Jakob. Thank you very much um, for the point. So um, to Alex's point, can we test the Swiss versus the uh, real estate channel? I think so, um, but I have to think about it a bit more. But I think there is, um, there is work to be done to figure out what exactly these different tax haven assets are doing, who's using which, for what reasons. My hunches are less scrutiny in real estate, so easier access, or like there has been less action to tackle real estate um, than there has been to tackle uh, tax haven bank accounts, which also answers part of uh, Angela's uh, question. So that's my hunch, but we haven't done any work in that direction yet. But it's an interesting suggestion, thank you. Uh, yes, the UK has been doing a lot domestically, and the tax results I couldn't go through due to time reasons um, in the paper are looking at one of these changes. So the UK has um, um, bit by bit extended capital gains taxation to um, foreigners, first um, foreign individuals, then foreign companies, then closely held companies that are property rich, and that's actually a change that we exploit, so it's not become pretty difficult to uh, carry out um, capital gains taxation evasion in Britain if you're a Brit. Um, or like to evade the, to get around the British capital gains taxation here. And we see that people react to that pretty quickly because uh, there was a little loophole with, Lux with Luxembourg that was forgotten and then all the investment moved into Luxembourg and we show that. Um, that's not all the story though, right? Because the foreign investor from a developing economy from wherever also might have to pay capital gains taxes at home, right? And so it's not exactly clear what happens with that and it's much harder for us to test that. 
because we can only do that when we mesh through the entire ownership chains. Uh, the same is true for the, for the ATAT, the annual tax on envelope dwell dwellings. Unfortunately, that's pretty early in our sample when it gets introduced. So we looked at it. It looks like it has an effect, but it's when our real-time data starts. So we, not, we, we just weren't that sure about that empirically. But yeah, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, lots of work that could be done with this data. Um, yeah, we, so far, we thought the tax part, the fact that it's tax sensitive, is maybe not the most interesting. Um, um, it's more interesting to look in kind of the illicit nature of it. But yeah, you're right. You could do more with it. Um, domestic register trans transparency. I only checked that for German data. The German register, the German. Uh, transparency register wasn't that successful. So just using Orbis without even using the leaks, we were already better at looking through ownership and the German data than the German transparency register with, for, for the few cases we drew. We haven't done that for the UK, but it's an interesting avenue. Thank you. Okay, Dominika. Um, yeah, thanks for the comments. Um, uh, I try to be quick about it. So uh, on the overall change in, in profit shifting, so I think that's driven way more by changes in business models, the increasing importance of uh, patterns, uh, trademarks, changing business models, and country by country reporting, obviously. I think that's where all the empirical evidence agrees has not been a game changer in as, as it is today against profit shifting. So in our empirical design, I mean, this is, it's, it's div in div, so we basically control for the increase in profit shifting and then look at differential trends among affected and non-affected firms. Um, yeah, manipulation around the thre threshold uh, is a good question. It's one we, we, it's the reason we do div in div and not regression discontinuity as some of the literature does. Um, so I think it's less of a problem, but we, we do need to, to think about it a bit more on how, what to do about it. Will public country-by-country country reporting be better? Um, I think a lot of things are changing, right? I mean, minimum tax, global minimum tax will come with some publication requirements. I think that works better than the country-by-country country reporting, to be honest. Um, it might help because the the what if you take our model seriously, the problem arises because the tax authority looks at the tax haven profits and not at domestic taxes paid. But the backlash in the public when it's published will be about, I think, about too little taxes being paid domestically and not so much about the tax haven. And in the if that's true, then you're right. Then making it public might really make it more effective. Um, yeah, we'll see in, I think, two th in two years or three years whether that's true. <laughs> Thank you. John? Uh, thank you for the comments. Um, the firms uh, versus uh, people uh, or individuals. Um, as far as I can read the literature, uh, we are finding, at least in the South African case, where I've also done uh, some of the work, we actually g get these sharp responses, immediate responses, uh, that could reflect that it's uh, not really uh, behavioral changes, but uh, these immediate shocks, uh, as we also find. So I would expect not to get the big effect in South Africa on firms as well. Uh, in other countries, I have to say I haven't done uh, redone the estimates. I'm not so sure. Uh, I think it's a mixed uh, bunch of uh, results. We are going to do it in Sa uh, Zambia, and we were actually starting out with the firms. Um, but just to be clear, we uh, need to do much more work with the revenue authorities in Zambia, because at the moment we have uh, way too few firms in the data. So there might be some compliance issues we need to uh, uh, look for uh, first before we look into the yeah, issue of bunching. Okay, um, <coughs> thank you very much to the presenters. Thank you very much to Mick as a discussion. Thank you very much for um, excellent questions. And um, I will, over the next uh, 24 hours, I'm going to speculate uh, whether uh, Mick will rant against the terms hidden wealth, profit shifting, and tax evasion. Because these are the... Only one of the three. <laughs> Only one of the three. <laughs> uh, because there are two more parallel sessions around these topics, plus also uh, a panel uh, tomorrow morning. So thank you very much.